Today I'm in the Chained Library, where all the books you are looking at in this series belong. The library was created in the early 17th century and designed according to the latest thinking about how a library should look and be organised. Fortunately, the Dean and Chapter did not scrap the existing library, but put the old books into the new one. So today, the medieval manuscript books, over 200 of them, are still here on the two end bays. They form one of the most important surviving medieval libraries in the UK. On the end of one of the bookcases, you can still see some lettering added in the 18th century with the Latin abbreviation for manuscript codices, codex being another word for book. Many of these medieval books were made or purchased for the library, but others were gifts, often made as bequests. The book I want to show you today is one of them. It dates from the late 13th century and eventually belonged to Owen Lloyd, who was a canon of both Exeter and Hereford cathedrals. It came to the cathedral in 1478, with several others bequeathed by him. There's no doubt that it belonged to him, because on the outside cover is his ownership label, covered by a thin piece of animal horn for protection in a tiny frame, known as a fenestra, meaning window in Latin. Some of the other books from his bequest have similar fenestrae. It's a big, heavy book. You wouldn't want to carry it far, and only a very wealthy person could have afforded it. The costs of the parchment and the employment of a scribe for the best part of a year would have been huge, and then, at a later stage, it was lavishly illustrated with very fine miniature paintings and decoration that on some pages spills out into the margins, luxurious extras. There are clues that suggest it was at Exeter Cathedral before it came to Hereford and that it could have belonged to John Grandison, Bishop of Exeter, from 1327 to 1369. If so, then he probably commissioned the illustrations. John Grandison was a prominent member of the wealthy family that included his contemporary, Sir Peter Grandison, whose splendid colourful tomb is in the Lady Chapel at Hereford Cathedral. He lies at peace beneath the canopy of saints with his feet resting on a dog, which is so realistic, it looks like a faithful hound gazing at its master. The book contains the most widely studied text about canon law during the late medieval period. Canon law is the law of the church. The text was compiled around the year 1140 by Gratian, a teacher of canon law at Bologna one of the top places in Europe to study law, and at the beginning of our copy is a miniature painting showing Gratian presenting his book to the Pope. Known as the Decretum, it describes itself as a concord of discordant canons, the word canons in this context meaning the norms and regulations of the church. There were very many of these, and by the 12th century they were in a bit of a muddle, seemingly containing contradictions and causing uncertainties. Gratian brought them all together in a way which made it easier to debate and clarify what the law meant. The Decretum became the top law textbook and quickly accumulated an accompanying commentary or gloss. The standard page layout for this type of book was for the main text, in this case Gratian's, to be written in the centre of the page, with the commentary in a smaller book hand around it. That way you could read both text and commentary without needing to have two books side by side. 
Each section of the book begins with a fine miniature painting which relates to the subject matter of the text. This one shows an oblate, a young boy, being presented to an abbot at the gate of the monastery, along with a gift of money. He is going to be a monk, whether he likes it or not. There are 38 of these miniatures, and 36 are within the initial letters of the text, literally enclosed within it. This one shows the sacrament of baptism. And here we see the ritual of hand fasting within the marriage ceremony. So far this is all very conventional, but look closer and you begin to see all manner of unexpected faces peeping out at you. On this page the main image within the initial letter shows a bishop being apprehended by two knights, one of whom is cheekily trying to remove his mitre. The horizontal bar of the letter E for Episcopus, Bishop, is barring the bishop's way. Look at the left end of the bar and you discover the head of a winged lion whose wings emphasise the curve of the capital E. And then you notice the details of the decoration on the bishop's cope and the knight's shield and fine pen work in filling the capital letters forming the opening words of the text. This is exquisite workmanship on a tiny scale. There is yet more to discover on this page. Towards the bottom of the decoration framing the text, the little face of a queen looks out and directly above her is a tiny monkey standing on its hind legs, peering at the text and looking slightly perplexed. And towards the top right of the page, looking towards the commentary, is this wonderfully delineated portrait of a man who might be a moor, but the lower part of his body is a column. Who is he? On this page, the artist's imagination seems to have run riot. There's a conventional miniature of a bishop bringing a legal case before the Pope. But look at all the other things going on. A man is kissing a woman's cheek. Both have the bodies of dragons or strange beasts. Two men with weapons look towards the main picture as if they are waiting for a conflict to break out. The one to the left stands on the shoulders of a dog-headed dragon whose very long neck rests along the frame of the picture. At the foot of the page, two men with elaborate dragon bodies are exchanging a kiss, while a gallery of grotesques and a couple of realistic looking crows perch in their intricate tails. Above them sits a black rabbit. What is going on here? And why are these strange beings depicted in a lawyer's textbook? These drolleries, and there are many of them in this book, are typical of 13th and 14th century books. They are not there by chance. They cost money, and so the person commissioning the book would have asked for them. As researchers are discovering more and more about medieval manuscripts and their meanings, we are realising that the images in the margins are there for a purpose, although we might not always understand that purpose very well. In a prayer book, they might be used to prepare the mind for meditation, or, as in the case of the Luttrell Psalter in the British Library, have special meanings for the family or person using it. In a biblical text, they might be used as spiritual exercises to strengthen the mind before approaching the sacred words. And also, the margins of books might be places where the usual rules don't apply, as in the margins of churches, the misericords, the ceiling bosses, the external stone carvings and gargoyles, where strangeness lurks. There is mayhem in the margins. Many of the creatures consigned to the margins are recognisable and friendly, 
but others are monstrous and scary. Next time, we'll look at why monsters feature so much in medieval manuscripts. <laughs>